You can get pretty far hacking NES games by simply knowing some 6502 and tooling around with an emulator. But if you really want to get the most out of the system, you have to know it at a deeper level. So in this episode, I'm going to take you on a tour of the NES's system architecture. I'm pretty excited because this is the episode that I've been building up to since basically the first video on the channel. When I started programming the NES myself, I began with some 6502 and basic techniques, but I was often confused as to why I had to do certain things. That all changed when I took the time to get to learn the system's architecture, because I was finally able to understand how the NES's hardware was reacting as it executed my programs. The format of this video is relatively straightforward. We'll start with an overview of the major components found on the NES, then I'll show you how those components are interconnected and communicate with one another. Okay, before we get started, do me a favor by hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. You can also hit the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post more videos on the channel explaining the NES's hardware. From a bird's eye view, the NES consists of a handful of components that communicate with one another to produce a fully functioning game. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you're probably somewhat familiar with most of them, but let's go through the list for the sake of completeness. The components are basically broken down into three major groups, the CPU-related, PPU-related, and cartridge-related components. The CPU and PPU components exist directly on the NES's motherboard, with the cartridge components existing on each game cartridge and interface to the motherboard via the cartridge connector. The first major component is the central processing unit, a custom processor based on the MOS 6502. The CPU is the main coordinator for the system and is largely responsible for telling all of the other components what to do, at least at a high level. It's also the only component in the system over which you have direct control, so when you write and assemble your games, this is what executes the resulting machine code. The chip, which is labeled RP2A03 on NTSC systems and RP2A07 on PAL, actually contains two processors, a modified 6502 lacking the decimal mode circuitry and a custom audio processing unit, or APU. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about the APU in this episode, but just be aware that it exists as a coprocessor alongside the CPU, and I'll go into more details in the future. The next major component is the CPU system memory, which is represented by a single 2KB SRAM chip on the NES's motherboard. This chip is used to store all of the mutable data for a game, things like animation timers, player health, etc., and represents the primary memory that you work with when writing a game's algorithms. Moving right along, we have the picture processing unit and its associated 2KB SRAM. The PPU is responsible for rendering a game's graphics and has a fixed set of functionality that cannot be programmed directly. Instead, rendering can be modified by way of memory-mapped input-output registers that can be manipulated by the CPU. The PPU SRAM, often called the Video or VRAM, is generally used to hold the name tables, attribute tables, and palettes. Additionally, it's used by the cartridge to control how a game mirrors name tables when performing screen scrolling. If you're not familiar with how graphics work on the NES, I suggest checking out my NES Graphics Explained video for an overview. The last set of components exist on cartridges and provide game-specific information. Every cartridge will have a program ROM chip that stores the machine code for the game, along with either a character ROM or character RAM chip that stores the tile data, aka the tiny 8x8 images that are used to compose the full background and foreground graphics. Additionally, some cartridges have their own general-purpose RAM chips that can be accessed directly by the CPU. And in some cases, this RAM is kept powered continuously by a small battery soldered onto the cartridge's PCB, allowing for the storage and retrieval of save game information. Finally, many games also contain special chips known as mappers, which can be used to change the behavior or output of other chips on the cartridge's PCB. Programs generally control a mapper by way of writing data to specific memory-mapped I.O. locations dictated by the hardware on the cartridge itself. I guess technically there's one more common component that you'll find on a cartridge, the CIC lockout chip. But when it comes to the overall system architecture, it's not really all that important, so I'm going to leave that as a topic for another video. Okay, so that's roughly all of the major components that constitute the NES's overall system architecture. With the components laid out, the next task is to show how they're interconnected and communicate. But in order to fully appreciate that aspect of the system, we first need to discuss how digital components talk to one another. 
At a very abstract level, digital circuits consist of only two basic ingredients, components and wires that connect those components. The wires are the avenues down which information travels, and the components are like factories that do stuff with that information. As I've covered previously on the channel, digital circuits use a special type of signaling, usually based on voltage, to communicate binary information along the wires that connect the components. This is called digital signaling, and the NES uses a common scheme where low voltages represent zeros and high voltages represent ones. Looking at it another way, any given wire or trace on the NES's printed circuit board can hold exactly one bit of information at a time, either a zero if it's at a low voltage or a one if it's at a high. Taking this one step further, we can say that any component on the board can only handle an amount of data equal to the number of traces that it's connected to. Now, not all of the traces on a PCB represent data. Some of them are providing electrical power to the circuit, while others are sending and receiving analog signals, such as the RF output that gets sent to a television. But when they do send data, the wires in the circuit are often grouped together in something called a bus. When there's more than one line, it's called a parallel bus, and when there's a single line, it's called a serial bus. For an example of the latter, check out my NES Controllers Explained video. Okay, focusing on the parallel variety, an 8-bit computer such as the NES generally has two major buses, a data bus and an address bus. The data bus contains eight wires and is used to communicate byte-sized information between the components, and an address bus is usually 16 bits in length and is used to communicate addresses. Every component in the computer that needs to access or manipulate data must be connected to both of these buses, with the wires of the data bus providing the binary information for the data itself and the address bus communicating which data to access. This arrangement of components connected to shared buses is the fundamental organizing principle underlying the vast majority of all modern computers, and it's as simple as it is elegant. However, if you're particularly astute, you may notice that there's a bit of a problem with the picture that I just painted. If everything on the NES is all connected to everything else all over the same wires, how does any given component know when it's supposed to provide or consume addresses and data? The answer to this question is that the NES employs an architectural technique known as memory mapped I.O. The I.O. here standing for input and output. Memory mapped I.O. is a technique that segments a system's overall memory space into multiple regions and assigns each region to a specific piece of hardware. For instance, the CPU memory space on the NES is segmented into four parts, the first for the system RAM, followed by the PPU I.O. registers, then the APU registers, and finally the last segment being mapped to the cartridge, with each of these regions occupying a contiguous set of addresses in the overall 16-bit address space. Further, the hardware for each of the components has a special pin known as the chip select or chip enable pin, which works kind of like an on-off switch. When provided with a low voltage, or A0, the chip will be turned on and will send or receive information via the data and address buses. On the flip side, when the pin detects a high voltage, or A1, the chip will be turned off and not interact with those buses. Now, the CPU always has access to both buses, since it's the central coordinator, and as such provides a specific address it wishes to interact with to all of the components. To see how this works, let's consider a typical LDA instruction. At a certain point during the execution of the instruction, the CPU will begin to emit the binary encoded data for the given address along the 16 lines of the system's address bus. This creates a binary representation of the address in the physical hardware of the NES. Looking back at the starting addresses for the regions in the memory map and converting them into binary, we see that certain bits of the address will either be on or off depending on the region to which it belongs. By using special hardware called a discrete logic chip, the NES combines a relatively small number of these address bits to produce a chip select signal for each of the individual components. In this case, the address 0305 corresponds to a memory location in system RAM, and the discrete logic hardware on the NES determines this by sampling the last few bits of the full address. Using this information, it then produces a set of chip select signals that are connected to the cartridge, PPU, and system RAM, with the final result being that the cartridge and PPU are turned off while the system RAM is turned on. At this point, the system RAM chip will read the address from the address bus and begin to emit the data that it finds at that address onto the data bus. The CPU can then read this data from the bus and load it into its internal accumulator register. 
Okay, so this is a slightly simplified version of what's actually going on in the NES's hardware, as there are a few more data signals being sent between the components to determine things like reading versus writing data. Additionally, the audio processing unit addresses are decoded and handled entirely inside the CPU itself, since the APU is a coprocessor on the same chip. It's also important to note that this method of using memory mapped I.O. by way of discrete logic chips on the board is only used to handle the CPU side of things, and that the PPU components use a slightly different system. Looking at it functionally, the PPU is technically only responsible for a handful of tasks. First, it must respond to the CPU via the chip select signal and the main system buses. This will result in the PPU either providing information back to the CPU or processing some information being given to it by the CPU. When receiving information, the PPU will either write data to one of its internal registers or out to VRAM or the cartridge via a separate data bus. The CPU has no access to this bus and thus cannot write the data itself. The second big task that the PPU must perform is the actual rendering of the game's graphics. To do so, it leverages information from its internal registers along with the data that it reads from both the VRAM and the cartridge. In order to communicate with both components, the PPU uses a single hybrid bus that's set up to handle both addresses and data. This bus is split into two parts, with the lower 8 bits representing both a byte of data along with the first 8 bits of the address, and the upper 6 bits representing the rest of the address. These first 8 bits are connected to a digital logic chip called a latch, which can record the values that it's given and continue to report them even if the inputs change. So what the PPU does here is to first report the addresses it wishes to access along the bus, then trigger the latch and finally switch the first eight lines of the bus to handle the data. The VRAM and cartridge's data pins are directly connected to the first eight lines of the bus, while their first eight address pins are connected to the output of the latch. So once the latch has been triggered and the first eight lines switched over to handling the data, they have access to both the full address and the data simultaneously. Unlike the CPU circuitry, the PPU doesn't directly control which of the components is active during one of these read or write cycles. This responsibility is delegated to the cartridge, which provides a chip select signal to turn the VRAM on and off. This design allowed developers to make games that handled their own VRAM with special onboard circuitry, which could be helpful if they needed to do something a bit different when generating the name tables, attribute tables, or palettes. As far as I can tell, most of the games that did this also used advanced mapper chips to allow the VRAM to be controlled by the CPU via the use of mapper registers, but a lot of games didn't do this and ultimately just made use of the video memory on the console's motherboard. Speaking of cartridges, they constitute the last major group of components on the NES's overall system architecture. So let's take a look at how their electronics are structured and interact with the system. As I've mentioned various times on the channel, an NES cartridge is primarily responsible for providing the game's program code and its sprite image data. The program code is stored on a chip called the Program ROM, and the image data is stored on a Character ROM or Character RAM chip. Both chips are connected to the system's CPU and PPU by way of buses that exist on the PCB for the cartridge itself. The ROM and RAM chips both have a series of address pins and data pins, which are connected via traces to the shiny pads at the bottom of the board. When the cartridge is slotted into the NES, these pads make electrical contact with the pins on the cartridge connector, causing the chips to be directly connected to the NES's address and data buses. Looking at the pinout for an NES cartridge reveals that the vast majority of those pads are dedicated to this task. This here is technically the pinout for a Famicom cartridge, you know, the Japanese version of the Nintendo. It's slightly more simple than the pinout for an NES cartridge, but for our purposes it's functionally equivalent and a little easier to analyze. Of the 60 pins that are present on a Famicom cart, 4 of them are used to provide electrical power, and a whopping 45 of them are dedicated to the address and data buses. Something of note here is that the NES doesn't provide a cart with the full 16-bit CPU or PPU addresses. This makes a lot of sense for the program ROM because it only occupies the upper half of the CPU's memory space, and thus only requires 15 bits to fully address. As far as the character ROM is concerned, it's a bit more complicated. By design, the 
NES expects a character ROM or RAM to hold a maximum of 8 kilobytes at any given time, enough data to store two full pages of 256 8x8 pixel tile images. And doing the math, we see that 8 kilobytes of memory can be addressed using only 13 bits. But instead of providing 13 bits, the NES provides a 14-bit PPU address to the cartridge. This is because games can sometimes hold their own video RAM, as I mentioned earlier, which contains an additional 8 kilobytes of address space, so you need an extra bit. The remaining pins are used to communicate signals between the cartridge and the NES. For instance, when the ROM select pin is brought low, it indicates to the cartridge that the NES is attempting to read a byte of information from the program ROM, and that the cartridge should enable that chip for output. An example of a pin that's used to send a signal from the cartridge to the NES is the IRQ pin. IRQ stands for Interrupt Request, and this pin is directly connected to the Interrupt Request pin on the CPU. When the processor detects a low voltage on this pin, it will halt execution and jump to a different part of the code to execute what's called an Interrupt Handler. Certain memory mapping chips like the MMC3 can use the IRQ to send an interrupt signal after a certain number of scan lines have been rendered by the PPU. This allows for advanced graphic techniques like changing palettes or other PPU-related data mid-frame. While mapper chips do have quite a few advanced features like this, their primary purpose is to select banks on the cartridge's ROM and RAM chips. This allows games to exceed the constraints of the 16-bit address space imposed by the system's architecture. As I covered in Nescart's Explained, games often have more program code and graphics data than can be addressed at any given time by the system. To get around this, ROM and RAM chips can be split into a series of banks that can then be swapped in and out as needed by a game's program. The specifics can change from mapper to mapper, but generally the way a program does this is by writing data into the program ROM space. When a mapper sees data being written to a specific program ROM address, it will interpret the data as a control message and change its behavior by swapping ROM banks or performing some special function. Finally, cartridges will often contain general-purpose RAM chips that allow them to supplement the RAM provided by the system. And mapper chips generally are responsible for coordinating between the RAM and ROM chips based on the address given by the CPU. Most of the time, these chips will occupy the memory map starting around address 6000 and be between 2 and 8 kilobytes in size. But honestly, the size and memory locations can vary wildly depending on the mapper. So there you have it. That's pretty much all of the components and connections for the NES's system architecture. It was a lot to cover, so let's do a quick recap to ensure that you caught all of the major points. The NES is composed of three major component groups, the CPU, PPU, and cartridge components, with all of the major groups connected to centralized address and data buses. The architecture leverages a technique known as memory mapped I.O. to designate regions of both the CPU and PPU memory address spaces to specific hardware components, with the system's motherboard using discrete logic chips to decode these addresses so as to enable and disable components on the shared buses. The PPU has a single bus that's used to manipulate data on both the cartridge and the system's onboard video RAM. And cartridges have their own internal bus architecture that connects a slew of ROM and RAM chips to the system, with addresses being decoded via a special chip known as a memory mapper. If you didn't fully grok the information that I laid out in this episode, that's okay. Maybe give it a think, rewatch some parts of the video, and post some questions down in the comments. Also, I have a few videos in the works that will expand upon some of the concepts that I only covered briefly in this episode. So if you want a more detailed discussion concerning some aspect of the NES's hardware, let me know and I can prioritize it accordingly. Thanks for watching NES Hacker. I'm gonna go spend some time not staring at the NES's system schematic. Link in the description.